Okay, so um, during the break, there was actually one question was someone asked about uh, giving a little bit more detail on the on cross validation in uh, in general, and this is really a big deal in this uh, this literature. <clears throat> and it sort of contrasts a bit with the way we typically in uh, sort of most economics uh, econometrics papers we would typically just take the full sample, estimate our model. On the, on the full sample and present the estimates and, uh, and standard errors uh, for that. So here, so here, this is in the context of, uh, of the tree, the, of the regression trees. Uh, so we have a sample of, uh, of n uh, observations. What we do is divide those into uh, to capital B cross-validation samples. That could just be a couple, uh, typically in this, this literature, uh, for computational reasons, uh, it's often uh, 10, but it could be as large as n, where you split it uh, n times uh, in a single observation and n minus one observation. So given these, so you do this randomly. You just, uh, and if you do it n uh, times into n minus one versus one, uh, obviously there's nothing uh, random left anymore. Uh, but if you do it with, uh, say, 10 cross-validation samples, you would just divide the sample randomly, completely randomly, into 10 uh, subsamples. Then you would so then, for a given value of this uh, penalty term lambda, you would, you would estimate the model uh, excluding the observations from the bth cross-validation sample. So if you have uh, 1,000 observations, 10 cross-validation samples, you would estimate the model for all values of lambda on the first 900 observations. Then you would look at the, the error of the, those regression estimates. So you, you estimate the tree on those 900 observations. You get a regression tree out of that. You predict for all 100 observations in the cross-validation sample uh, what the predicted outcome is. You compare that to the actual outcome in this, uh, the cross-validation sample. Square those, add those up and do that both over those, you do that first over those 100 observations in that cross-validation sample, then you go to the next cross-validation sample, re-estimate the trees on the, on the other 900 observations, uh, calculate the errors in the cross-validation sample, and so you do that for all uh, uh, 10 cross-validation samples. That gives you, gives you, if you do that for all values of lambda, that gives you a function of lambda, and you minimize that, you find the value of lambda that minimizes this uh, sum of squared errors, and use that, then go back to the full sample and estimate the tree given that value for the, for the penalty term. And so, the, uh, in principle, that, that sort of sounds like a, a computationally uh, very demanding procedure. With trees, as well as with lasso, there's a lot of tricks that make this feasible, uh, in particular with trees. The, implication of the algorithm is that there's only a discrete set of lambdas you actually need to look at, and so that makes it much easier to, uh, to implement uh, these methods uh, and allows them to, uh, to scale fairly, uh, fairly well. Now, um, the, sort of since the early work on the regression trees, there have been a whole, uh, there have been a number of, uh, of modifications and improvements uh, there. And again, I don't expect people to kind of get all the details from this, but I want to discuss sort of some of the conceptual ideas, because a lot of those apply not just to trees, but also to other ways of, uh, of looking at supervised learning problems uh, in regression, as well as classification. Uh, and so one uh, issue with the trees, the way I, the tree algorithm I described uh, just now is that it may stop too early. If, in fact, the regression, suppose we just have a single covariate uh, and the regression function uh, is, uh, is quadratic in uh, the, the covariate, it may not find a good place to split because it, uh, the, on both sides of the split, the average outcome may be fairly similar, uh, even though if we split it a couple of times, we could do much better than, uh, than not splitting at all. And so to... Um, um, to deal with that type of problem, uh, uh, what, what people actually typically do in practice is not simply grow the tree the way I described uh, so far, but grow a much larger tree, keep splitting beyond the point 
where there's an improvement in the, in the objective function uh, with the hope that further down you may find uh, substantial improvements in the objective function. So initially you allow for splits that don't really improve things very much uh, with the hope of later finding splits that, uh, that do improve things. Then once you have this really big tree, uh, and in principle that may go as far as, uh, as grow, keep splitting till there's just very few observations in, the, in each of the, these leaves. And then the, to the, deal with the fact that at that point you've overfitted the regression function to a substantial degree. The, then to deal with that, uh, there's the notion of pruning the, the tree to take the, the gardening uh, metaphor uh, further. Um, and so we have this big tree with a lot of, uh, of um, branches that don't really improve the objective function, but that were simply grown to avoid uh, missing uh, uh, subsequent interactions. Uh, but now at the last stage, we get rid of these, uh, these branches that, uh, that don't improve uh, the, the objective function uh, very much. And then, but this way, you, uh, you give yourself the opportunity to find interactions even if there are no main effects uh, uh, without uh, uh, running the risk of overfitting things. And so here, and this is probably not very visible uh, uh, from, uh, from the back, but so here I uh, looked at or the front, uh, yeah. the, but if, so if you have the electronic version of the, the, the slides, you can kind of see here, this is for the same data you use for, for Lasso and OLS. Uh, we have earnings uh, and eight covariates, uh, and the, you see that, uh, not surprisingly, the, the tree splits on uh, some of the lagged uh, the earnings variables uh, and ignores, in fact, most of, uh, of the other variables. Uh, and, um, Ultimately, so here I just split it a couple of times uh, to make it fit on the slide. But if you do that uh, for the full data set, uh, the tree, even though it gives you a very different, uh, it's sort of a very different approach to getting the regression function, does, uh, like Lasso, does substantially better than, uh, than OLS, though in this case it doesn't do quite as well as, uh, as Lasso. Not surprisingly, because some of the covariance here are continuous and actually the lagged uh, versions of the outcome. So linear regression models uh, have some advantage over uh, simple uh, splitting, uh, splitting algorithms. And to see what this, uh, this looks like in terms of the predictions, uh, here is a scatter plot with the predictions for, the, the, for lasso versus uh, the, the tree predictions. You see the tree predictions only take on relatively few values, uh, but ultimately the correlation is actually very high between the, the tree and, uh, and lasso predictions. Now, um, next I want to look at some um, methods for, um, that, that, are, that can be used in, the setting, in settings of, uh, of trees, and I'm, I'm going to look at it uh, there. But actually general uh, conceptual ideas to, uh, to improve the supervised learning uh, methods. Uh, and they can be used sort of also with lasso. They can use, be used with, uh, with kernel methods. They can be used with uh, neural networks or support vector machines. Uh, and so one of the key, uh, key ideas there is, uh, is the notion of boosting. And so the, suppose um, we have a, a very simple way of, uh, of estimating uh, a regression function. Uh, and it's going to be a very simple one uh, and clearly not a very... Uh, uh, very attractive one, and I'm going to refer to this uh, following this literature as a, as a weak learner. Uh, boosting is the, is the idea of, uh, of using these weak learners to get a, get a good predictor for, for regression or classification uh, problems. Uh, so we're going to start with a very naive, very simple way of estimating a regression function, but we're going to use that repeatedly and that way build a, build a much better way of uh, estimating the regression function. And so in the, the tree setting, the, the very simplest uh, way of, of getting an estimate of the regression function is just using a single split. So I, I, I may have 200 or 2,000 uh, covariates uh, and the single outcome and maybe a million observations. I'm going to estimate the regression function by just splitting the sample into two. Uh, so I'm just going to split it on a single covariate. Uh, that's going to be very fast, but obviously it's not going to be very accurate. Uh, I can 
use it most one, uh, one covariant, uh, and so it can't give me a very good approximation uh, to the regression function uh, by itself. But then the idea behind boosting is to take the prediction error after this, this using this weak learner and do it again. So I estimate the regression function just using the single split. I compare, I uh, subtract that from the outcomes, uh, and now I'm going to take the residuals there, so the difference between the outcome and this, this estimated regression function, and I'm going to apply the same uh, algorithm to this new data set, but now the thing I'm trying to predict is this residual. Now the one thing that's sort of clear is I'm not going to split on the same covariate and exactly the same place, because there it would, it would not improve anything, because the mean residual on the two, two leaves is exactly the same. So it's going to split either in a different place or on a different covariate. And it's going to improve the, the prediction overall uh, by, by, at least by some amount. And so then I'm going to do that, again, calculate the residual from that second uh, weak learner and go back and reapply the, the weak learner to this uh, second residual. And I'm going to do this possibly thousands of times. Uh, and so now I'm going to try use this simple learner so combining all these, these very, very simple, naive estimates of the regression function to get a much more complicated, uh, complicated function. And so what is interesting is that this actually doesn't, so whereas a tree in principle is going to be able to, the, the three algorithms I described before, in principle can approximate any uh, regression function arbitrarily accurately kind of with enough data because you can split the sample in enough ways. Boost it, using boosting with this particular weak learner where I just split it once, can't actually approximate any uh, regression function because uh, the, it enforces an additive structure on the, on the regression function. So it can only approximate regression functions uh, by additive uh, functions. Now, that in itself may still be, may already be a very rich class of, uh, of functions, so there may not be a problem. But what is interesting here is that it gives us the ability to put a lot of structure on the, on the estimated regression function. If instead of uh, using this, the, the single split weak learner, if instead I used the weak learner that split twice, the, then I would the, allow myself the ability to approximate any set of functions that is additive in functions of at least two covariates. And so it, it I would allow for general two-way two interactions. And if I started with a weak learner that allowed for three splits, I would allow three-way interactions. So you can control the complexity of the approximation you're allowing for in, this, uh, in the boosting algorithm by uh, changing the, the weak learner you're basing this on. And so ultimately, this, this has been in sort of many settings, not just in this, this regression tree uh, case. But the idea of boosting that you use simple uh, and arguably naive and uh, inadequate methods, but use them repeatedly to get uh, very accurate, uh, uh, very appealing solutions to whatever the machine learning problem is you're looking at uh, has been very successful. Uh, and so the way th these are uh, often, uh, often used is that uh, people use them in the, so in, the, in the tree setting, they use them with relatively shallow trees, uh, in, uh, up to say six splits, so that that's in principle uh, allowing for six order interactions, and then uh, uh, grow many trees, do four to five hundred uh, iterations of this, calculating the residual and reapplying the, the, the weak learner. Now, of course, in principle here, we have two sets of uh, tuning parameters. We have how the number of trees uh, we use, and then also the number, um, and also the depth of, uh, of each individual uh, tree. And so, in principle, we could try to use cross-validation methods to, uh, to optimize over both uh, parameters. In practice, I think that's very hard. Uh, and so what people do um, typically is, uh, is use fairly shallow trees, just pick six, because uh, Tip Shirani said six was fine, and then, uh, then, use, then only optimize over the number of, uh, of trees and do that by monitoring on a test sample that was not used in the estimation to see 
the, at what point the prediction, the, the, the root mean squared prediction error starts uh, deteriorating, again, in the, in the spirit of, uh, of cross-validation. Um, another uh, concept, uh, uh, again, I'm going to illustrate it here in the context of, uh, of trees, although it can be, uh, approxim can be used more, more generally. Uh, and this is referred to as, uh, as bagging. And so, again, this is Stanford guys sort of stretching the, the ways they get their acronyms together here. Um, but, um, Efron is one of the, the originators of, uh, of this idea. So um, the concern is with, with trees that are very discrete. You kind of saw, saw that in the, the, the scatter plot, uh, if you actually estimate a tree on a particular sample, then over large parts of the, the covariate space, the regression function is, uh, is constant. Uh, and it just, it's very discrete in that way. Either two observations are in the same leaf uh, or, or they're not. And so there's, there's a number of, of ideas uh, bagging uh, it's one of them, as well as uh, random forests, that try to find some way of smoothing over that to end up with predictions that are, in the end, fairly, uh, fairly smooth. And so there's a couple of uh, reasons why that, uh, that might be a good idea. Uh, ultimately, it may actually improve uh, things by, by smoothing over, uh, over different trees. And then another very interesting uh, the, the idea that people have pursued here is that the by averaging over many trees, you actually may be able to get distributional results, uh, and especially, uh, especially in the context of, uh, of random forests, uh, it looks like uh, you can get asymptotic normality by uh, averaging over these trees, where doing that for, for basic trees, uh, it's hard to imagine that that's, that's even possible there. But so bagging is a very simple version of this. Uh, so if you have a sample of size n, we draw a bootstrap sample of uh, uh, size n from those data, we uh, construct a tree on that bootstrap uh, sample. Uh, and we may do a simple tree. We may do uh, pruning. We may uh, do any version of, uh, of the tree. But then doing that on these bootstrap samples, ultimately we're going to estimate the regression function by averaging over these bootstrap samples. And that's sort of clearly going to change. You know, if you think of this, doing this with a single covariate, it's going to change exactly where you split uh, each time. And so it's going to smooth over the edges of the step function uh, and you're going to get a more continuous uh, estimate of the, of the regression function uh, and one that ultimately may, may actually uh, be more open to uh, uh, distributional analysis of uh, distributional properties. Um, last of the, the three modifications, uh, and this has been a hugely successful one, uh, random forests, uh, that is that's arguably one of the best sort of off-the-shelf methods for estimating uh, regression functions. Uh, uh, so again, there's a lot of software floating around for, uh, for doing this. Uh, and this tends to give fairly uh, good properties uh, the, uh, fairly quickly. So it has some of the features of, uh, uh, of, of bagging, uh, but it uh, adds another component that, that's going to help with the, the smoothing. Uh, so we do the same thing as bagging, that we get these uh, bootstrap samples of, uh, of size n, but uh, it differs from, uh, uh, from that in the way it estimates the tree on the, the bootstrap sample. Uh, so um, we random, the, the key feature is that we random, we don't look at all the regressors for deciding on which way to split the sample. We randomly select the uh, some of the regressors out of the, the full set of regressors. And we only choose the optimal uh, covariate to split on and the optimal threshold among those, uh, those selected regressors uh, rather than in the, in the full set of, uh, of regressors. Then we, uh, we split the sample and we keep splitting it uh, again, each time randomly selecting the regressors uh, and uh, splitting uh, among the, the threshold and choosing among the threshold and the, the covariate uh, there. And then we do this for all the bootstrap samples and average the trees over all those, uh, the, those bootstrap samples. And so that's, that's going to make for much smoother the estimated uh, the predictions in, in the test sample. Uh, and it's going to look much more like what you would 
like the regression function uh, to be like uh, compared to, uh, to simple trees. And so again, you would do this in principle many times. Uh, obviously, now you need to select this additional uh, the tuning parameter and the number of regressors, uh, which is some um, rule of thumbs. Uh, but other than that, it's fairly easy to, uh, to implement. And so as I mentioned before, there's now some distributional results uh, for, the, the, for these random forests. <coughs> Although the, they're sort of very, fairly limited in, the, the, in that they re require you to estimate the, the trees on very small bootstrap samples relative to the overall uh, sample uh, uh, in a way that's, that's not really very realistic. But it's suggestive that, that here distributional results may actually uh, hold. Yeah, um, yes, thank you. Um, so here, so going back to kernel regression, um, there the, the traditional results uh, that, that are used in the, the econometric literature, uh, and Behrens is a, an older reference on that, is that for a particular value of x, the estimated regression function at that particular point has an asymptotically a normal distribution uh, centered at the true, no depending on how you do the, sometimes you may need to do some bias reduction, uh, but in principle that's centered at the true value with some variance. And so you can use confidence intervals uh, for the prediction at a particular point. And so that's what would be the goal here, that for a particular value of x, you could actually get a prediction at a confidence uh, interval associated with that. And at least for the random forest case, <coughs> that, that appears to be possible, uh, though the conditions are still very limiting. For where that, uh, um, that would hold. Um, okay, now leaving the, the tree uh, literature, let me look at another uh, set of methods. Uh, and this actually uh, goes back a reasonably long way, uh, the, the work on neural networks. Uh, in fact, in the 90s, Hal White wrote a number of papers uh, uh, using these methods, uh, but recently, there's been a lot more work, and people have found ways of scaling them up so that now some of the big tech companies uh, run these neural network models with uh, uh, many, many variables, uh, many, many layers, and many, many, many uh, observations. Uh, so here, the idea, again, is to be interested in modeling the relationship between a set of uh, features, uh, covariates x, uh, and some outcome. Uh, and so that's done through uh, having uh, hidden layers of unobserved uh, variables. Uh, and so given, and so here I'm going to just illustrate that uh, using a single uh, unobserved layer. So that we, we think there's these unobserved variables, uh, CI, and there's a bunch of those, uh, capital uh, M. There, these Cs are modeled in terms of, uh, of these axes uh, through some parametric uh, model, uh, with, typically with linear coefficients. Uh, and then the outcomes are modeled uh, uh, as linear functions or, or parametric functions of, uh, of these intermediate variables uh, Z. So here, that's just a linear model for the Ys in terms of, uh, of the Zs. In principle, we can have multiple layers where sort of the first layer of Zs affects some second layer of, uh, of variables, and it's only the second layer that affects the ultimate outcome, uh, but the principle is, uh, is the same. It's just a single layer of, uh, you know, of unobserved uh, variables. And so, we specify these parametric models relating the axis to the, the z's. Uh, we specify these parametric models relating the z's to the, to the y's. And now we're going to try uh, estimate these models uh, by minimizing the sum of squared deviations uh, between the predicted values, which you can write ultimately in terms of, uh, of the observed regressors uh, x and, uh, and the outcomes. Computationally, these things are obviously very, uh, very messy. And there's been a huge amount of work trying uh, to come up with good ways of, uh, of both estimating these models as well as regularizing them very quickly. The, there's a big danger of overfitting these, uh, uh, these models. They, they, uh, they're incredibly flexible. Uh, they allow for very complicated interactions between, uh, between the axes. But it comes at the expense of having lots and lots of, uh, of parameters. Uh, and so, you need to be very careful in, uh, in how you regularize uh, these parameters, how you shrink them towards uh, zero um, or other values. Uh, but then they, they tend to be incredibly powerful in, um, in terms of uh, uh, giving 
uh, interesting comparison uh, approximations to the regression function. So often the um, regularization <coughs> is done in terms of uh, L2 norm uh, type penalty functions, so where we sum over all uh, parameters, the square of the parameters, uh, both for the alphas and uh, and betas, and then we find the optimal amount of regularization by monitoring the sum of squared prediction errors on a test sample. So as you estimate this model, you have a test sample that you don't use for estimation. You keep calculating the sum of squared errors in the test sample, uh, and as you relax these parameters uh, more and more, starting with uh, a very heavily regularized uh, model with a very large value of lambda, as you keep relaxing that, you keep uh, uh, monitoring how that improves the sum of squared uh, residuals in the test sample, and, and you stop when uh, when that's being uh, minimized. Well, so um, so this this is an area where there's a lot of active research going on. There's, there, there's some people who feel th these methods are incredibly powerful and uh, and have a lot of potential for the. Uh, getting good approximations to regression functions in very high dimensions. Uh, whether the, I think the jury is still out whether these, these things really work incredibly well. As I said, sort of Hal White was doing this in the, in the 90s, uh, and then I remember people paid polite attention and then uh, stopped paying attention after a while because it wasn't really clear that these methods were actually delivering. Uh, but certainly now I think at, at some of the tech companies, people uh, feel that they are actually doing very well. In, uh, in getting predictions. For images, videos, like that. Yes, yeah, for the, for kind of the super high dimensional uh, the type problems. I'm saying like images, videos, that's where they're using them in practice right now, like really big complicated things like that. But I, th I think you know, there's still some skepsis about uh, uh, how use, <laughs> useful these things are in, uh, in practice, but it's, it's likely to be one of the methods where there's a, there'll be a lot of work in the <laughs> in the next uh, five years. Um, so the last part of the, the supervised learning I want to talk about is uh, uh, referred to in, in uh, with various terms, ensemble methods, model averaging, uh, or super learners. Uh. And so the idea there is that we may have a number of, uh, of candidate algorithms for estimating the, the regression functions. They may all be similar uh, in a sense when we're doing the random forest, we, we're using all these different uh, trees and then uh, average them. But it could also be qualitatively completely different uh, for this, with the same data. You could uh, estimate the regression function using lasso after kind of creating a lot of interactions, or you could use trees, or you could use uh, rich methods, uh, or, or you could use kernel methods. Uh, and it, no, or you could use neural networks. Uh, and the idea is to try to combine them, uh, find some way of averaging these uh, predictors to get a better estimator, and ideally one that is better than any of the single, uh, single algorithms. And the, the, there's a couple of uh, general comments. So the, the, the idea is here is not to find a single method. It's not to, find a, to select out of these, these candidate estimators one method that is the right one uh, to use. Uh, it's not like a testing type setting where we try to find uh, the one true method. Uh, it is trying to find a set of weights that, uh, that um, give us a better predictor than uh, each of these estimators uh, in, uh, do on their own. And in some, in, um, in some of these machine learning competitions where people try to come up with algorithms for solving particular problems, uh, in the end, it is often uh, algorithms that combine a lot of more basic methods that do really well. And so you can imagine that in some cases, uh, Lasso is going to do very well for estimating regression functions if, in fact, it is true that um, there's some covariates that matter a lot and a lot of covariates that very, matter very little. But in other cases, rich may do much better. In other cases, trees may do very well. And so having a suite of methods uh, and then getting predictions based on all of them and trying to get estimate weights for the for all these methods uh, to get a combined estimator uh, can be a very uh, attractive way to uh, to get very good predictions uh, in the end. But the winners average like 800 models, not five. Yeah. So so at that point, the, um, at that point, the, the, even in that stage for estimating the weights it's likely that you want to do some regularization. So, so one way 
the, um, of combining these, these estimators is so you, you could imagine that you started off with a training sample where you estimated all these uh, uh, um, different uh, methods, uh, including trees, including lasso, including uh, neural networks. Uh, and then on a second sample, some test sample, uh, you try to estimate these weights uh, for the different uh, methods. So you try to come up with the alphas that uh, they give you the best uh, predictor in the, in the test sample. And at that point, if you have a large number of these methods, as Susan's saying, um, if you're actually trying uh, hundreds or thousands of, uh, of different uh, methods, you may want to regularize that second problem, uh, and including a lasso type uh, L1 penalty term where you uh, shrink this, uh, uh, these weights towards zero and limit the number of models that actually enter into, these, uh, uh, into this uh, combination estimator. So um, when I did that sort of here on this, this Lalonde data, uh, where originally the um, OLS <coughs> did very poorly compared to Lasso and, uh, and trees, if I try to combine these, uh, these three, and so here it's not hundreds of them, it's just these, uh, these three, it put most, most of the weight on Lasso uh, and a little bit on the trees. In fact, it, it, it did uh, pretty much the same as, uh, as Lasso on its own, but it certainly uh, in a lot of cases you would expect these ensemble methods uh, to, uh, to do well uh, compared to, uh, to any single uh, method. But again, the, the idea here, the question is not so much to, uh, to try to distinguish between OLS, Lasso, and, and three methods uh, here. It's try to come up with a method that, uh, that combines the, the best of, uh, of all three through weighting. Okay, so now the last uh, uh, 15 minutes of the second lecture, I want to talk about the unsupervised learning uh, methods. And so partly I'm, I'm going to spend much time, much less time on this than on the supervised learning, because it's, it's less directly related to, what, uh, to a lot of what we do in, uh, in econometrics, uh, and it's going to be harder to directly uh, fit this into the, the way we think about a lot of, uh, of problems. So the, the, unsupervised, the basic unsupervised learning uh, setup we have a number of uh, observations on, uh, on some factor of, uh, of features, uh, and we're trying to find patterns in these data. And then maybe to just reduce the, the typically the, the goal is to find some way of reducing the dimension of, uh, of the data. And that may then itself feed into supervised learning type uh, problems uh, or other uh, questions. Uh, but initially, the, the idea is just that we may have too many uh, features to really uh, uh, be able to deal with, uh, uh, with all of them. And so one approach is to just uh, find linear combinations of these axes that capture most of the information in the, in the data. And that's something that's, uh, that has a long tradition in econometrics uh, using principal uh, components, uh, where sort of even going back at 60s uh, types textbooks like uh, Tile's Principle of Econometrics, uh, there's a long discussion on principal components because uh, he didn't want to do OLS with many regressors, uh, and so he just wanted to find the, the key components uh, there. Um, second approach is to, uh, uh, a little bit like uh, three methods, uh, to partition the space into a finite um, set of, uh, fi finite set of subspaces, uh, and then we could try fit models uh, to, these, uh, to these subpopulations. So there, what we want to do is divide the sample with n units, into k different uh, groups, or communities, uh, or clusters, uh, and then we may may try to uh, to do things within these uh, these clusters of relatively uh, to the original axis, relatively homogeneous uh, subpopulations. Uh, and there, the most closely related literature in econometrics is that on uh, on mixture modeling. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit about that, as well as about uh, sort of less model based methods for constructing these uh, these clusters. So the principal components, uh, again, that, that has a long tradition in econometrics, and we're just trying to find linear combinations of, uh, of these axes, uh, or we model the axes as linear combinations of, uh, of an underlying set of, uh, of factors uh, y in a way that uh, the, the dimension of these y's is, uh, uh, we have fewer of the y's than the, than the axes. And so 
I'm not going to go into much detail here, but we're trying to somehow minimize the difference between X and this uh, linear combination of these, uh, these principal components. Uh, and that turns out to be a very fast problem. It's just a matter of uh, calculating eigenvectors uh, of the X, uh, X prime uh, matrix. The clustering problem, and I'm going to look at two versions of that, uh, but the, the one that is uh, familiar, at least in part of the econometric literature, is just modeling these axes as coming from a mixture of parametric distributions. Uh, so the leading example would be to think of uh, the distribution of x as a mixture of normals uh, with unknown mixture probabilities uh, and unknown uh, factor parameters of, the, of these normal distributions. Uh, so for example, you could uh, uh, model the, the L factors x as uh, coming from a mix of k multivariate normal distributions uh, with k probabilities pi k and parameters for these uh, normal distributions uh, theta k. So at that point, um, uh, we have a fully parametric problem. So in principle, we could just do maximum likelihood, uh, but it turns out to work incredibly uh, badly. In the, in the 80s, this literature was sort of popular in the duration literature where people estimated mixtures of, uh, of duration models. Uh, and so when I was a master student uh, in England in uh, Hull, I would run these models and they would just take forever. Uh, obviously, we didn't have a lot of computer yeah, power in those days. Uh, so, uh, using this fancy computer in, uh, remotely in London, uh, and it would take days for these models uh, to estimate because they're incredibly uh, poorly uh, behaved. Now, using the EM algorithm, actually, in principle, makes this easy. Uh, it's just very slow. Uh, but uh, rather than doing maximum likelihood, you would. Uh, uh, start by assigning all the, the units to the different mixer components, estimate the, the parameters of each of the mixer components, and then go back to updating the, um, the probabilities uh, in each step. Uh, and so the, the, in, in one of the papers that, that I suggested on, for the reading list, uh, there's 10 algorithms in machine learning, uh, in the machine learning literature, the EM algorithm was, is one of these uh, algorithms because it's incredibly powerful for estimating uh, this type of, uh, of mixture problem. Now, the, these, work, these work well, but they, they're very, very slow. Uh, and, uh, and so in practice, uh, you don't want to do this for very high dimensional uh, mixture uh, models. Another algorithm that's actually very fast uh, although it has its own problems, uh, is the, the k-means algorithm. So here, this is looking at the same problem. We have n observations, uh, and we're trying to divide them into uh, to k uh, clusters. Uh, and the idea here is uh, to start with, uh, with relatively arbitrary center points for these, uh, these k cluster, clusters, the centroids, uh, then assign each observation to the, nearest, to the centroids that it's nearest to. So if a particular observation, if you calculate for each observation, the distance to each of these uh, centroids, you assign it to the one that is closest to, do that for all observations, and then you recalculate the centroids as the average uh, of the observations, uh, overall observations in that, uh, that cluster. And you do that, uh, you go back then to reassigning the observations, uh, given that the centroids have changed, which, which uh, in the cluster observations is uh, assigned to may change. And then you keep doing that. Uh, that's actually a very fast algorithm for, uh, for dividing observations in, uh, in clusters. And what you end up with is just a partition of, uh, of the sample into uh, k clusters uh, that are relatively homogeneous in their, their covariates. And then often that'll be the basis for some subsequent analysis where you may want to estimate uh, models within these, uh, these different uh, clusters that are now more homogeneous uh, than the, than the original set of observations. The, this is very fast. Uh, in the main concern is, is really to, um, is to the sensitivity to the starting values. Uh, obviously, if you start at all the clusters, with, if you start with all the centroids being identical, it, uh, the algorithm would uh, immediately uh, stop. And so exactly how you choose the centroids in a way that, uh, that the, the final values are not sensitive uh, to that can be a little tricky. So what people do in practice 
is uh, started many times at different uh, values uh, and checking that, uh, that things uh, converge to the same, uh, um, to the same values. Um, last algorithm I want to cover here is again one that doesn't directly fit into a lot of things we do in, uh, in economics, but it's been very useful in, uh, in the, the general machine learning uh, literature. It's sort of trying to find uh, what are called association rules in, uh, in data sets. And so here the canonical example is one where we have n customers. Uh, they each choose out of the number of uh, items out of a set of, uh, of m items. And we want to find patterns in these data. So here there's no model. There's no uh, model sort of about how people choose these, uh, these items. We're just trying to find which items tend to go together. And uh, the algorithm is about an efficient way of finding uh, sets of, uh, of items that a relatively large <coughs> number of customers uh, bought together. And so <coughs> the, but the, the inputs there are sort of the, what we were looking for there is the set of uh, all uh, subsets of k items that are bought together by at least uh, l customers, where l is an, uh, is an input chosen by the, uh, for the algorithm. Uh, so we start off with n customers. We may have a million customers. We want to find all sets of, uh, of 10 items that were bought uh, by at least 100 uh, customers. Uh, and so what the algorithm does is it starts with uh, just a single uh, <coughs> single item baskets, uh, and so then it looks for all items that were at least bought by 100 customers. That gives a subset of all the items, uh, and any set of items that has at least, any set of 10 items that had, has at least uh, 100 customers uh, buying those 10 items must be included in that set uh, F1. And so you, uh, recursively you go, you go, you go down this uh, set, the number of items, where each time you reduce the set looking for the subset of uh, sets of items that have, have at least 100 people uh, buying them. So with, uh, <clears throat> first we start with a set of uh, single items that have at least 100 people buying them. Then we look at all uh, combinations of items in that set that have at least uh, 100 individuals buying them. That gives us uh, F2 as a set of all pairs of items. And then within that set, you go look for uh, sets of, of three items with at least 100 customers up to the, the, the point where you have sets of, uh, of 10 items. And again, there's sort of no model here that is underlying this uh, about the individual behavior. What we're looking for here is just patterns in the data that it themselves may, uh, may be useful in, uh, as inputs into how to model the, the behavior of the, of the customers here. Um, it's given that I have three more minutes uh, now. I'll, I'll, spend, I'll spend these last three minutes on support vector machines uh, from, uh, from Fabnik. Uh, there's actually two books by Fabnik on this, uh, I think, 700 pages total. Uh, and so, <coughs> uh, but it, this has sort of become one of the most important algorithms for, for classification. Uh, so. I'm going to illustrate this. I'm going to look at this in a setting where we just have two classes. Uh, so we, we have a sample of, uh, of pairs of y and x, uh, where y is uh, minus 1 or 1. And we want to have an algorithm that for new values of x assigns them to one of these two classes. Now, again, traditionally in econometrics, you might have uh, modeled this as a, as a logistic or uh, probit regression model, uh, where you try to estimate the probability of uh, being in one class rather than the other. Uh, that's not what is, uh, what is done here. Here, it is simply defining the covariate space into two parts, the minus one and the one uh, part. And it's trying to find, find good rules for, for coming up with, uh, with the classification uh, there. And so if, in fact, and in some cases where we're estimating models of this type, we actually really need the probabilities uh, in the, the program evaluation literature. It's often very important not to just have, to have rules for assignment, but actually estimate the propensity score. These methods don't, uh, are not intended uh, for that. 
Here, it's simply about uh, classifying these uh, uh, methods into uh, to two groups. And so you may start off uh, with, uh, with linear rules, and later you can, uh, you can extend that by using uh, uh, expansions of this into functions of, uh, of x. But you can imagine starting just with a linear rule, where we try to find the beta naught and beta 1 that help us assign units to the, the minus 1 or, uh, or 1 class. So we want to choose the beta naught and beta 1 that helps us uh, dis uh, partition the, the space most effectively. Uh, and so what, uh, what support vector machines uh, do is to try the so first let me back up. Suppose we actually, uh, there is such a rule that completely separates the y is minus 1 and the y is 1 group. Uh, in that case, we can look for the, the value of beta that maximizes the margin between these two groups. Uh, if there is going to be a linear function, a hyperplane that separates these two groups, uh, there's typically many of them. And so we look for the one that most effectively does so by maximizing the margin uh, between the, the two uh, groups. And imply, if we find such a positive margin, it means that for all the, the, the observations, each point is at least a distance m away from the boundary of, uh, of that separating uh, hyperplane. And you can write the solution for beta, not on beta 1 uh, in the way here at the, the bottom. Uh, and that gives, you the, the, that gives you the solution in the case where you completely separate these, uh, um, these two groups. Now, in practice, of course, we can't separate these two groups exactly. And so now we're going to add penalties uh, for observations that are not separated uh, by this, uh, by this hyperplane. Uh, and so uh, we're going to add this penalty uh, uh, epsilon i. We're going to try to minimize these uh, or restrict the total amount of, uh, of penalties and try to find this hyperplane that separates this as much as possible while penalizing observations more that are, far, that are on the wrong side of the boundary, especially those that are far on the wrong side of the, of the boundary. And it turns out the sort of very effective algorithms for doing that that have, have proven to be very successful in, uh, in doing these classification uh, problems, uh, much more successful than simple uh, uh, discriminant analysis uh, type pro approaches uh, that are very closely related to the logistic regression. And the key thing is that somehow the support factor machines use penalties for getting for misclassifications that are much more effective than the implicit penalties that are used in, uh, in logistic uh, regression. And so that has something to do with the way in which they don't actually include rewards for getting the classification very right if, if an observation is on the right side of the boundary and very far so but it just put in penalties for being uh, slightly on the wrong side of the, of the boundary. And so, in principle, these, these support factor machines also allow you to do regression in a, in a way that's, that's quite different from the way we're used to. Uh, there hasn't been quite as, as successful as in the, in the classification, but for classification, it's one of the, the key uh, methods.